citizens of two worlds. And the theme text from Jesus, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's from Matthew 22, 21. The conversation from which our theme text comes in this devotional study finds the Pharisees trying again to trap Jesus. They could use a wrong answer by Jesus to stir up trouble for him with the Roman rulers, or perhaps to work to defame him among the Jewish people. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each tell about the encounter, but Matthew 22, 15 to 22, is a good beginning point for considering things the Bible says about Christians being the citizens of two worlds. The first reading is from Matthew 22, 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention <clears throat> to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrite, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Jesus, with his simple yet brilliant answer, foiled the Pharisees' latest attempt to entrap him. At the same time, he declared that every man has two duties, duty to civil government and duty to God. As Peter, John, and the other disciples began to practice their faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, and set about using their spiritual gifts in proclaiming the gospel, they soon found out that duty to God and duty to man often come into conflict with each other. Peter and John's arrest and interrogation before the Sanhedrin in Acts 4 is an example of how they handled it. It was a lengthy session before the court. We'll look quickly at one exchange, Acts 4, 18 to 20. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. 
The story of the believer's conflict of duties to God and duties to authorities did not end there. Luke says in verse 23, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they began. Their prayers were answered. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. We Christians are citizens of two worlds. We have choices to make. As we found in Acts 4, Peter had a lot of experience dealing with the conflict between the two loyalties. He gave wise counsel in 1 Peter 2. Verses 9 to 17 are especially applicable to us. And we'll begin to read with verses 9 to 12. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 12. But you are chosen people. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Verses 9 and 10 in this passage describe Christians, that is, believers in Jesus Christ, as being special. Peter calls us a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, the people of God. He also tells us that believers are people with a mission, a mission to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Verses 11 and 12 of this passage explain that even though we believers are God's people, we live in this world as foreigners and exiles. We are in a risky position. Peter counsels us to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Part of living that good life is abstaining from sinful desires that war against the soul. That's a worthy, lifelong objective. The question is, how do we accomplish it? How do we live as citizens of two worlds without failing either in our duty to Christ or our duty to man. P. 
Peter mentions some helpful guidelines us uh, guidelines for us to follow in the next few verses. First Peter two thirteen to seventeen, and I read: Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who were sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to silence and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. I have identified three attitudinal guidelines in this passage that I think may help us in our struggles as citizens of two worlds. Our attitudes toward these guidelines will make a difference for us and for others. The first guideline is be submissive to civil authorities, verses 13 to 15. And I repeat that. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. End of quotation. Good citizenship is a spiritual matter to Christians. Peter says to do this, quote, for the Lord's sake, end of quote. Good citizenship recognizes that the offices of authority are ordained of God. The Apostle Paul discusses this matter more fully in Romans 13 to 17, but we'll not go to that at this time. Good citizenship is God's will for Christians so they can silence the ignorant criticism of unbelievers. Guideline number two, practice freedom, verses, verse 16, and I quote, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Freedom is like a muscle that tends to atrophy if neglected and not used. Christians in America have two levels of freedom. As citizens of a free country and, in, and as believers under free grace. In either case, we have freedom to do right, but not to do wrong. So, Christians should practice freedom in both civil matters and in spiritual matters. But we must be careful not to use our freedoms as a cover-up for evil behavior. 
we should live as servants of God in all things. The third guideline that I mentioned is verse 17. Demonstrate, demonstrate respect to all. The verse says, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. In general terms, on the secular side, respect everyone, seeking to protect the dignity of each. God has made us all unique, yet each of us has much in common with others. What happens to all, to one? What happens to one affects us all. In specific terms, on the spiritual side, love the brotherhood. That is the family of believers. The church universal and local churches. Let me read that again. In specific terms, on the spiritual side, love the brotherhood, the church universal and local, and fear God, that is, acknowledge him in all things, worship him, and reverence him. All of us Christians know what that means. Peter says to do it. In specific terms, on the secular side, honor the governmental leader. In Peter's day, the top secular leader was the emperor of Rome. Regardless of what the emperor was doing, Christians were to respect and honor him. We in the USA have a different system of governance than what Paul lived under. We must apply this guideline to honor the rule of law and those who administer it. The wisdom of Proverbs 24, 21, and 22 fits well, <clears throat> fits well with what Peter said about God's people living in two worlds. And I quote from Proverbs, Fear the Lord and the King, my son, and do not join with rebellious officials, for those two will send sudden destruction on them, and who knows what calamities they can bring. Some closing thoughts. So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. We need to remember that those are words that Jesus spoke. This statement Jesus made to the Pharisees, trying to trap him, is a basic principle of, for God's people of all time and all places to follow. It was not intended for just the people of Jesus' day. Neither should citizens of the USA think it was intended just for them. It is intended for all believers throughout the world. Christians, wherever we live, are ambassadors for Christ to a lost world. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation of leading men, women, and children to receive Jesus and trust him as Savior and Lord. Our effectiveness as ambassadors will be affected by our attitudes as citizens of two 
world. Let's pray. Father, thank you. So being, for Jesus, being so straightforward, so easy to understand way. Help us, Father, to live as Jesus taught us to live. We know we need your forgiveness and your and cleansing. We need your indwelling spirit. We need a strengthening of our faith in our living Lord. We need courage, strength, wisdom. You know, Father, all the things that we need. But help us that we will be good representatives of Jesus Christ in this world so full of sin and trouble. Help us to be children of hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.